An idea came to my mind which is in fact so obvious that it might easily be overlooked. It's only possible to dive deeper in one highly particular place at a time. And reflecting on the theme of the conference in relation to my own experience, it occurred to me that translation, which has come to be so much a part of my life, can be a means of diving deeper, always in one very specific and sharply defined place. Furthermore, just as the area on which a diver can home in, so to speak, is no wider than the width of his or her own body, so also the voyage of discovery on which translation can send us will always be limited by aspects of one's own particular person. <coughs> Thus, I shall only find it possible to discuss this subject by reference to my own experience. And this is actually what Francesca asked me to do, so <laughs> I hope you will forgive me for the, the personal element in this um, <coughs> discussion. So often I've been surprised by the way that a translation read beside the original will reveal something in it that I hadn't seen. Well, the, process, the translation process itself will draw attention to details that in reading the original text alone might not seem important. Translation, by which I mean both the activity and its outcome, involves a negotiation between cultures. And when we translate, we enter a space of exploration where the ground is uncertain and the searching never finished. Correspondingly, when we experience a translation as listeners or readers, we find ourselves in a place where the sands are inclined to shift and where we may suddenly catch glimpses of things unfamiliar and strange. Although a sense of being unfinished and provisional, of being no more than a compromise with the infinity of the possible, may attach to many, perhaps most, kinds of writing. In translation, this is very particularly the case. If we want to read Homer or Dante in English now, we do not usually turn to the translations of past centuries. Indeed, we probably recognize very few of the names of the people responsible for those translations. Instead, we look for a modern translation into a version of the language as we know it. Translations are written for their own times. And in fact, I think that David Jasper was reminding us about this last night and speaking about Cranmer's attitude to translations of the Bible. Translations are mostly subject to continuous superseding by more up-to-date versions. In this respect, then, they are temporary and provisional, an ever-open invitation to others to go back to the original text and try again each translator in turn striving to capture some element in the original that seems to them most important, each straining after an impossible ideal. What is expected of a translator seems a simple thing. In the words of Ronald Knox, you must find out what the original means. You must try to express in your own language what the other man was trying to express in his. In practice, this simple-sounding goal proves endlessly elusive, and every approximation to it prompts as many questions as it answers. The searching and unfinished nature of the activity of translating, and the fact that its outcome is never the final statement, is well captured in the almost epic simile with which Ronald Knox begins the last chapter of his collection of reflections on translating the Bible, from which I've just quoted. Knox carried out this task single-handed in the space of nine years, an astonishing achievement in the tradition of St. Jerome, whose Vulgate version of the Bible was in fact the basis for Knox's. It's a translation of a translation. Literary as this remark is, it's on the handout that uh, Francesca has, has given you. This comment, this from the beginning of uh, Knox's last chapter, uh, also bears the rueful marks of a translator's real experience. As the traveler, lost in some impenetrable jungle and convinced that he will never make his way out of it alive, sits down to blaze on a tree trunk the record of his wanderings for the benefit of some luckier explorer, I've highlighted that word, in times to come, so the translator, seeing the end before him of a task which can never be complete, is fain to draw breath, to look around him, and to meditate on the reflex principles which have guided him thus far. Many aspects of translation that will be important to my discussion are implied in this passage. 
First, there is its exploratory nature and the immense difficulty and even risk of the enterprise. Second, there is a sense of the intuitive, not entirely conscious faculties that it involves, reflex principles. And third, there is the conviction that even the end product of the task is a compromise, its completeness only illusory. The exploration goes on. We have only come thus far. In Michael Edwards' book, Towards the Christian Poetics, published in 1984, which is one of the works which has inspired my discussion, and one which certainly arises out of the writer's own experience as a creator, translator, and reader of poetry in two languages, English and French, there is a startlingly original suggestion concerning translation. It is the idea that in between the original and its translation, a silent space comes into being which is an expression both of yearning for one absent, perfect language imagined as existing in Eden, and of hope reaching out towards a new heaven and a new earth. In the silence between, this third text which comes into existence, if it is not that absent language, is at least the yearning towards it. And in so being, says Edwards, it becomes the most eloquent of the three utterances its absence, a powerful presence, its blankness and silence, a way towards Pentecost. This is to place the activity of translation, which as every translator, none more so than Ronald Knox, knows is deeply down to earth, grounded in the particular, in what Edwards would probably call a rather steep perspective, in which the local becomes the site of infinite play and possibility, to use one of the words most important to Edwards. In the following reflections, I would like to look at translation both from the point of view of its earthiness and practicality, the sheer hard work involved, its extreme localness, like the extreme localness of diving, and also in the light of this astonishingly bold conception of Edwards, which lifts the activity and its result into the realm of what can only be termed spiritual exploration. For if the context of the, th the con conception of the third text, the unseen space, holds, then it means that translation, as long as it is not purely utilitarian, as long as it has about it even the remotest element of art, of the gratu gratu gratuitous, sorry, to invoke David Jones, always has the potential to be a spiritual activity, a witness to an expression of spiritual longing for a lost or longed for oneness and completeness, regardless of whether the first and second texts involved register any overt interest in such matters, still less whether they recognize the concepts of Babel or Pentecost, which are central to Edward's discussion. In this way, the always incomplete nature of translation can be a way of pointing beyond to what is perfect and whole, as William Blissett put it in another not utterly different context in an early review of David Jones' Anathemata, a long poem which moves continually among the words of different languages and of different subsets of English. Another reflection suggested by the image of the conference title, as well as by the passage from Englishing the Bible quoted on the handout, is the totality of commitment, the acceptance of risk that diving deeper requires. In accordance with the direction in which this image has taken me, suggesting that the exploration involved is not only highly particular, individual, and limited by the bounds of one bod one's own body, but is also risky and calls for a high degree of personal commitment. I shall now need to place what I have to say in a context which is not academic in the strict sense. When I think back to my school years, I see that my interest in both life and study in what is between, in what has to be translated in various ways, was already developing at that stage. When I chose my A-level subjects, I chose English, history, and physics. It wasn't a very easy choice to uh, force through, but I, <laughs> I was allowed to do it in the end. When I went on to university, I went on to read English. But I remember discussing at my interview for universities, I thought this arts scientific divide was somewhat artificial. Of course, I've forgotten now most of what I learned in physics, but I suspect that something of the way of thinking that it encouraged in me remained, maybe to come to consciousness again years later when I translated some poems into English by a Polish quantum physicist. 
This was a work of translation that involved not only the question of Polish and English, but also that of the sub-languages of scientific discourse and of cultural and historical concepts shaped by different experiences than my own. At the time that I took the entrance exam to read English at Oxford, the papers included so-called unseen written translation from Latin and from a modern language, in my case, French. I knew not a single word of Polish in those days. I was only to begin learning the language 13 years later. But I always found moving between one language and another an exhilarating experience. When, during my first year of studies, we were required to learn the old English of the 9th and 10th centuries, a language that was effectively foreign, requiring to be, to be translated, I was not in the least inclined to complain. I found it exciting when the choir I sang with performed Brahms' German Requiem, because although I had never learned any German, with the help of my newly acquired knowledge of Anglo-Saxon, I could recognize many words in the text and sometimes see how their meanings and associations had evolved in different directions in English and German. Take, for example, the very first sentence of Brahms' text taken from Luther's translation of the Bible. I'll try to say it in not too bad German. Selig sind die da Leidstragen, denn sie sollen getröstet werden. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It was thrilling to notice the correspondence of Zelig with the old English word geselig, happy, fortuitous, prosperous, and then Middle English selly, innocent, guileless, knowing how far the modern English word silly, descended from the old English, had moved in meaning from that of a common Germanic root. To think of such things, and these are connected with translation, is to be taken deeper into one's own language so that what seemed obvious ceases to be so. Everyday words become defamiliarized. In the second and third year of my degree course, I chose the much, much less popular option, the so-called course two. Uh, no one else in my college chose this course. They think they'd had enough of translation. Um, but I enjoyed this choice because it gave me the opportunity to dive deeper into the language and literature of Old and Middle English and the early modern period. And in more recent years, the delight of this choice has returned to me as I've become acquainted with the work of David Jones and pondered the inspiration of the dream of the rude to him, as well as the ways in which the tradition represented by that wonderful poem has made itself felt over the centuries. It was also a translation in a broad sense that led me later to the subject of my doctor's thesis, which Francesca mentioned, on what I call the image of Eliot that functions in Polish literary consciousness. I happened to come across some poems by the Polish poet Tadeusz Różewicz in a bilingual edition. In the moving metaphysical yearning expressed in these poems, I felt an undercurrent of hidden, subtle, and perhaps rather contrary reference to Eliot, although I never heard that Rzewicz took any interest in this poet, and his worldview and style of poetry seemed on the surface extremely different. It was the poetry of Rzewicz in a kind of dialogue with Eliot that was to prove most important for the development of my later interests. It was this that brought me consciously into the space of exploration that translation involves. This experience of reading both poets, as it were, in translation, each reflecting on the other, was to lead me towards a deeper study of religious poetry. I wrote my thesis in Polish, but I was dealing with material from two languages, and not only learning much about Polish poetry, but also looking at Eliot's poetry from one point of view so well known to me, from another angle, seeing it in linguistic, but also cultural translation. The thesis is located in a borderland. The issue, issues it raises concern points of convergence and divergence between English and Polish, various literary traditions and conventions of discourse, various kinds of historical experience. The experiences of my own life have also made me, in myself perhaps, a person of the borderland, living in a way in translation, a Polish-speaking English woman, a convert to Roman Catholicism brought up in the Anglican Church, striving to explore the places where these various cultures meet. And it is Eliot who defines these places for me. They seem to me indeed to be places of spiritual exploration, where I constantly hope, finally, as Eliot puts it 
in the end, at the end of Little Gidding, in the passage quoted on the handout, to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. It's often through the practice of translation that I've been taken deeper in understanding of cultural and historical difference. The various translation tasks that I've undertaken over the years since becoming familiar with the Polish language have often played into my work as a literary scholar. For example, while translating some texts for an album published to commemorate the opening of the military cemeteries honoring the Polish officers secretly massacred in the Katyn Forest and other places, I came across phrases like, they fell on the field of glory, which in the context sounded impossible to me, brought up as I was on the poetry of Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. It was this experience of translating that really brought home to me the force of Paul Fussell's thesis that one of the casualties of World War I was the high diction of war poetry, which the soldier poets rendered unusable by such poems as Dulce et Decorum Est, or Suicide in the Trenches. I learned then that the discomfort I felt with such innocent expressions of patriotism as I found in the Polish album was culturally conditioned, and the experience of translating became one of diving deeper. Now I want to say here that I've, I'm going into rather touchy areas, and uh, I don't want to suggest that my interpretation is the, the only possible one, only that this activity of translation opens up these questions, um, opens up this space of exploration. I think that Paul Fussell is undoubtedly wrong to imply that the high diction collapsed principally under the pressure of appalling experience, that of the trenches of World War I. If appalling experience in itself were sufficient to destroy that diction, then how could it survive in Poland after Katyn? It is surely something else that accounts for the fact that such passages as the one quoted on the handout sound so odd in English, so awkward and embarrassing. Maybe you could have a look at the passage. I summon you, you who were murdered in Kharkov, Katyn, Tver, and other as yet unknown places of brutality in the East, all of you whose bodies were turned to nothing, crowded into nameless ditches and mutilated, mutilated by those who many times tried to keep the sight of this brutal massacre hidden from the world. Answer the roll call, fallen in glory on the field. This passage, in spite of its brevity, reveals much, I think, about what it means to be Polish emerging as it does from assumptions that are deeply rooted in the nation's tradition and at the same time very remote from the outlook of most present day English speakers. These assumptions make the English of the translation seem awkward, as if English words were being used to express concepts that do not belong to the language. I translated the title of this summons as Role of Honour for the Murdered Dead. But in fact, the role of honor, in which the names of those who died in battle are listed, is only the equivalent of the Polish here in the respect that it honors the memory of the dead. It is not a summons of any kind. Perhaps then, a more accurate translation of the title might be roll call, the phrase I used in the text itself. But a roll call is a summons to the living to answer to their names. And here, the summons is not to the living, but to the dead. To the English ear, there seemed to me something strange in this direct appeal to the murdered dead, speaking not only about them, but to them. And this is one respect in which the translation of this one short passage takes us into issues of cultural and religious history and difference. In the English tradition, in the collective consciousness reflected in literature since at least the time of the Gothic novel, it seems to me that the graveyard is a haunted place, a place to stay away from at night, unless one has a taste for witchcraft. In contrast, the Polish apel, spoken from the heart of a cemetery, emerges from a culture in which cemeteries are not places to be avoided or feared. Instead, they are places to go to, to seek the friendly presence of the dead. Um, as the customary celebrations of All Saints Day and All Souls Day in Poland abundantly illustrate. As an expression of culture, regardless of how it corresponds or does not correspond to individual and personal belief, 
the direct appeal to the dead in this passage could be seen as a sign of thought patterns shaped by a Roman Catholic rather than Protestant approach to the doctrine of the communion of saints. Prayers for the dead are not typically associated with most forms of Protestant liturgy, and calling on the dead to be present in a cemetery in an English language context might perhaps smack less of appropriate reverence for one's fathers than of crossing into forbidden spiritual territory. This is one illustration of the way in which a task of translation casts light on cultural differences, making one reflect on the processes and developments that lead us to find some things familiar and others strange and challenging, taking us beyond our daily habits and horizons of thought. Even more noticeably, the passage quoted here provokes the question of how such words as fallen in glory on the field can possibly be applied to people who died in circumstances so brutal and dishonorable. We might be reminded here of the rather beautiful and moving words of Lawrence Binion's poem, For the Fallen, but that poem, They Shall Not Grow Old, as we that are left grow old. That poem is intended in praise of those who fell in battle, perceived as honorable combat, not those shot through the head, back of the head, and bundled into mass graves. When we've heard in the passage from the album, quoted on the handout, how the dead were killed and what was done with their bodies, the English words, fallen in glory on the field, sound like a mockery, or perhaps like the most crass and shocking insensit insensitivity. Why is this? It seems to me that we might find a possible answer to this question if we look back to how the writing of such poets as Sassoon and Owen affected concepts of patriotism. I am very well aware that the tendency today is to regard the judgments, their judgments of the conduct of the Great War as unfair and to suggest that these judgments have dominated the narrative and distorted the public perception of that war. But undoubtedly, during the years 1914 to 1918, the revelation of the horror of the trenches coincided with a sense of betrayal by those in authority, a breakdown of the nation's sense of unity and common purpose. Whether this was justified is another matter, but his influence, I think, has been profound on the language, casting doubts on the concept, concepts of nation and patriotism. In contrast, very, very broadly speaking, there has never been any doubt in Polish history as to who the aggressors were, and generally speaking, they have been outside. As a result, the whole national romantic tradition is still alive, and it's still possible to refer to a soldier's death, even in the most treacherous and degrading circumstances, as glorious. As a matter of fact, uh, some even find it possible to apply the vocabulary of the fallen patriotic hero in ways which now are deeply ambiguous and painfully divisive. As, for example, in reference to those who perished in the Smolensk plane crash in 2010. But uh, that's a, a subject that would require more time than I can give it today. In English, Horace's maxim, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, came to be seen as a lie because the concept of patria became suspect. Was it worth dying for a country that betrayed its people, uselessly prolonging the war? The pointed, po pointless, wasted sacrifice of so many lives came to be seen not as glorious, but only as pitiful and terrible. Where does this leave the translator? When such a clash of assumptions between the original and the translation makes itself felt, there may be nothing to be done but to leave the foreignness to speak for itself. Its very strangeness will then be a sign pointing beyond, bringing us into a space of exploration where we transcend the boundaries of our own historical and cultural experience and go out to meet the other. The principle favored by the great Polish translator poet Stanisław Baranczak is to find a paradigm in the language of the translation that will liquidate the sense of strangeness, making the translated text part of the culture of the new language. And this might also seem to be the goal that Ronald Knox sets himself when he writes, any translation is a good one in proportion as you can forget while reading it that it is a translation at all. But sometimes, paradoxically, communication may be better achieved if the reader of the translation is shocked into re realizing how specifically his or her thinking is different from that of speakers of the original language, and in what respects the words he or she uses have different associations. 
this can be a way of stepping out into a space of exploration of ourselves and the cultures that shape us. To take another very different example of how translation can help us in this realm of what I call spiritual exploration, i now like to discuss briefly a piece of correspondence between the Polish poet Czesław Miłosz and the American Trappist monk Thomas Merton. Two or three years ago, during the centenary of Miłosz's birth, I was invited to contribute to a conference held in Kraków in Polish on the American Miłosz. The aim was to focus attention on the Polish poet in relation to the context in which he lived for a large part of his creative life. I chose to speak about the decade-long correspondence that he conducted with Merton. Now, this exchange, this correspondence, has a very curious publication history. The correspondence was conducted in English, which is also a, an interesting choice, Merton offered to write in French, and at the time, that would have been a much easier language for Miwash to use, but they agreed on English. The first publication of the text was in a Polish translation, made not by Miwash himself, but by Maria Tarnowska in 1991. It was only six years later, in 1997, that the original correspondence was published with the title, Striving Towards Being. Now, it's very interesting to compare this extremely unusual original with its translation. Anyone who knows Miłosz's poetry, whether in Polish or in English translation, must surely be struck by the impression of struggle and incomplete command of the language that his letters evoke in the original English version. And this becomes even more noticeable when contrasted with the linguistic elegance and control implied by the Polish translation. I don't know whether the task of rendering the letters of Thomas Merton into, English, into Polish uh, entailed any particular difficulties for the translator, but I'm quite sure that she encountered no problems at all in translating the letters of, of Miwash out of English. For the original letters that Miwash wrote were already effectively a kind of translation from the Polish in his head. Under the English word surface, the sentences flow as if in Polish, and when translated back into the language that was in his head, the letters become natural sounding and deeply refined. To illustrate this, we need look no further than the opening of Miwash's reply to Merton's attempt to initiate contact. Merton was the one who got in touch with Miwash in the first place. Did, did I put this on the hand up? Perhaps not. Okay, so this is the beginning of Miwash's first reply to Miwash. Merton is a Trappist monk, remember. Dear Mr. Merton, your letter traveled quite a long time. I thank you cordially for it and feel it created already a tie between us. That would be unfair, I think, given the rarity of the circumstances. This is not every day that one engages in correspondence with a Trappist monk uh, to criticize me, Miwash for not knowing the accepted mode of address. Dear Mr. Merton, but in this short passage, we find a whole range of other linguistic and stylistic phenomena, which even if they're not precisely mistakes, are nevertheless in subtle ways not quite natural in English. For the passage to sound like something a native speaker of English might conceivably write, a whole range of minor changes would have to be made. Something like this, perhaps. Thank you very much for your letter. It took a long time to reach me, but I feel as if what you wrote has already made a kind of bond between us. That's my attempt to make it sound a bit more natural in English. Countless examples of this kind are to be found in Miwash's letter to Merton. But all the mistakes, or perhaps better, departures from natural English evident in them, become expli explicable when we try translating the letters into Polish or when we compare them with the translation made by Tarnowska. It then becomes clear that in order to obtain a stylish and elegant Polish text, one only has to restore those Polish sentences that lie hidden under the cloak of the English words. Miwash's slightly foreign English is thus in itself a symbol of the problem of exile, of existential and spiritual estrangement that preoccupies him here as in all his writing. At the same time, however, writing in English, writing in translation, as it were, from his own language, enabled him to enter into a space of exploration and discovery 
where he could find, paradoxically, a childlike freedom and innocence of expression and meet his correspondent, a fellow sufferer from spiritual homelessness, in sympathetic understanding, despite every difference in external experience. Each partner in this exchange, seeking for someone who spoke the same language, as Merton put it, found what he sought in a person who, in the literal sense, did not. In Miwash's original English letters, as already effectively translations, the boundary between original and translation becomes blurred. Or perhaps we could say, following Michael Edwards, that the boundary, instead of becoming a dividing line, acquires a third dimension. It becomes a conjoining space, a third text, in which two correspondents of different origins and different experience can, can each go out beyond themselves, striving towards being, as implied by the very good English title of the correspondence. Translation, however, with all its inspiring potential for joyful exploration and spiritual growth, is also frequently a painful labor, as we can see when we compare the English of Miwash's letters to Merton with the Polish that was evidently in his head. Stanisław Barańczak writes with a sense both of the immense effort involved and of the hopelessness of the task of the writer who attempts to translate his work into another language. While attempting to hammer the peg of his work into the hard, resisting log of a foreign culture, he cannot help but damage both bits of timber. That's Stanisław Barańczak. Seamus Heaney makes the following wonderfully vivid comment on his first attempts at translating Beowulf in the mid-1980s. It was labor-intensive work, scriptorium slow. I proceeded dutifully like a sixth former at homework. I would set myself 20 lines a day, write out my glossary of hard words in longhand, try to pick a way through the syntax, syntax, get the run of the meaning established in my head, and then hope that the lines could be turned into metrical shape and raised to, to the power of verse. Often, however, the whole attempt to turn it into modern English seemed to me like trying to bring down a megalith with a toy hammer. Ronald Knox, in an image as lively as Heaney's, has this to say of the labor of translation. The translator who understands his job feels constantly like Alice in Wonderland trying to play croquet with maling sorry, trying to play croquet with flamingos for mallets and hedgehogs for balls. Words are forever eluding his grasp. <laughs> for words in one language do not have exact and unchanging equivalents in another that apply in all circumstances. Most ordinary words in any given language have a range of meanings and associations. And moreover, these constantly change and evolve. For Ronald Knox, the only remedy for these problems uh, is to keep in mind the extreme particularity, the localness of the translator's work. This is a quotation from Knox's Reflections. Your duty as a translator is to think up the right expression, though it may have to be a paraphrase, which will give the reader the exact shade of meaning here and here and here where each here may require a different expression in the target language for the same word in the original. The diving deeper of translation, whatever vistas it may open up, is always particular. In the face of the difficulties involved in the task, Seamus Heaney gave up the project of translating Beowulf for some years, until he experienced a kind of epiphany, lifting him above the sheer labor involved a perception of the cultural and linguistic memory enshrined in the words of his own brand of English. He writes, in the etymological eddy, I glimpsed an elsewhere of potential that seemed at the same time to be a somewhere being remembered. It's in the introduction to his translation of Beowulf. In the case of Beowulf, it was the word thol which proved to be the catalyst enabling him to discover, or perhaps I should say rediscover, the voice he needed for the poem in modern English. This diving deeper of translation, sounding the depths of the language, might be seen in the terms of Eliot's Little Gidding as returning to the beginning and knowing the place for the first time, at least in linguistic terms. Or in Edward's not essentially different terms, we might say that beyond and through the intense labor of the task, the translator is vouchsafed a glimpse 
of an elsewhere where Babel is overcome. As Edwards suggests, translation heads towards variations, revealing possibility, a world transfigured, new heavens and a new earth which would satisfy our desires. For this world, because of its grandeur, for another, because of its misère. Those Pascalian categories are um, the part of the basis for Michael Edwards' discussion. This is a quotation from Towards the Christian Poetics. The change wrought by translating draws its ultimate significance from the dialectic of creation, fall, and recreation. Translation is the only kind of writing that engages us with the fall of language explicitly. It opposes Babel, not only by doing what it can to remedy the confusion of languages, but also by looking to the end of confusion and the redemption of languages for which all writing searches. Translation, says Edwards, reveals the truth that every so-called original text is already babelic, in that it is an imperfect translation of an absent, supreme, and perfect language. Translation seen in this perspective is a high calling. Certainly the translator of a poem or a sentence of literary prose, as much as the writer of the original, may have the sense, certainly desires to have the sense, of what Geoffrey Hill calls atonement in the radical etymological sense, an act of at one a setting at one, a bringing into a concord, a reconciling, a uniting in harmony, which comes when, in Yeats's phrase, which Hill quotes, a poem comes right with a click like a closing box. Yet despite these aspirations, a kind of humility is required of the translator, who is often largely invisible. His or her name on the published work is often not prominent, while the original author's is. So a strange thing happens here. The original and the translator disappear, replaced by the translation and the original author. The self-effacingness that is often expected of the translator can be a painful experience of being overlooked by people blissfully unaware of the time, commitment, and love involved, who regard translation as a service that needs no acknowledgement after it has been paid for, since it is seen as belonging to the sphere of the merely utile rather than that of art, to use David Jones' distinction. Fame does not accrue to translators as such in the way that it does to other authors. Heaney, for instance, is known as a poet and only incidentally as a translator. More often than not, the work of translation is only noticed and valued by other translators. But this was not always the case. The Polish scholar Anna Legorinska has written extensively on the authorial capacities of the translator, which she places on a level with the capacity of the writer of the original text, calling the translator its second or other author. This is also Edward's idea, and it goes back a long way. The authors of the introduction to the Sydney Psalter, the uh, translation of the Psalms um, by uh, Philip and Mary Sydney, draw attention to the complex question of whose voice we hear when we read these versions of the Psalms, fed as they are by so many different sources. How can we locate a true original? As John Dunn suggests in his poem, In Appreciation of Their Achievement, part of which is quoted on the handout, Mary and Philip Sidney's work is a re-revelation of the songs whispered to David by heaven's high holy muse. The poem, placed at the opening of the Sydney Psalter, suggests the value placed in its own time on the work of the brother, and especially the sister, who was responsible for by, for by far the larger part. The editors also emphasize not only the metaphysical wit of the poems of the Psalter, but also the immense variety of poetic forms employed, declaring that we should recognize, as Renaissance readers did, the critical skill and creative power necessary to make a translation readable as an artistic work in its own right. Today, the idea of writing a poem in praise of a translator or a translation would, I think, be inconceivable. Attitudes have changed. Legorinska, even in a culture highly conscious of the importance of translation, has had to argue anew for something that in the past was clearly self-evident. In support of this, we may cite not only Dunn, 
but one of John Keats' most famous and frequently anthologized poems. I'm talking, of course, about the sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer, printed on the handout, whose title, moreover, suggests a complete equality between the original author and the translator, or even a subsuming of the prior text in the latter. The sonnet not only expresses in its content the enormous exhilarating inspiration afforded by a translation, but is in itself, in being a poem, the expression of that inspiration. For my purposes, it's also striking that the poem's imagery is the image of exploration that I've used in my title and that Ronald Knox uses in the passage I quoted at the beginning. Uh, in this remark, which I'd like to quote on Keats' sonnet, taken from Wikipedia, which I'm not quoting, of course, as a scholarly source, but as evidence of current popular assumptions, we find an unexpected, and I think surely not directly intended, expression of homage for a translation, Chapman's version of Homer. This is the quotation from Wikipedia. The poem has become an often quoted classic, cited to demonstrate the emotional power of a great work of art and the ability of great art crea to create an epiphany in its beholder. It is worth pondering the fact that the great work of art that calls forth this reaction in Keats's poem is not Homer in the original, but Homer in translation. Translation, viewed as Edwards reveals, uh, reviews it, reveals itself as a process of reconnection and recovery an undoing of the Tower of Babel, in which human language moves away from its confounding, restoring communication, hinting towards community. And while it would be too much to see in this more than a faint glimpse of the idea of the communion of saints, there may nevertheless be in translation a means towards a kind of spiritual communion of writers or texts, linking what Legorinska calls the second author with the first. There is some way in which we hear the text in the original and in the translation as the voice of a person. And in between them, I suggest, there is a space of a kind of dialogue. I'm thinking of here as translation, as perhaps surprisingly, a space of sympathetic communication. As a translator, I listen and I try to show that I understand or how I understand what the original writer is saying by reshaping it in my own words which are also the words of a different language. In this way, I am drawn to the original writer. I try to think and feel as he or she does. If this communication really works, it can lead to an astonishing and humbling consequence in which the distinction between author and second author seems even to disappear. I once had a particularly clear sense of what this can be like when I translated a short story written by a friend for him to read aloud in English during a literary festival held in Gdańsk. The organizers of the festival asked us to sit together on the stage in case the audience wanted to ask either of us any questions. As it happens, they didn't, thankfully. And my role was limited to sitting in silence and listening to the story being read aloud by my friend in words which were in equal measure mine and his. And I had this eerie and very joyful sense that if he'd written the story originally in English rather than in Polish, this is exactly what it would have sounded like. <laughs> and perhaps it's interesting here that the very idea of translation is implicit in this story. The central character of whom it tells is himself a kind of embodiment of translation. His name is Luglas Will. He's a real historical character from the 17th century, whom Neil Asherson mentions in his book, Stone Voices, the book which provides the epigraph for my friend's story. This is the, the epigraph from Neil Asherson. Lugless Will traveled on foot. He took a ship when he came to water, but otherwise he walked through England, Ireland, Spain, Switzerland, Germany, the Low Countries, Bohemia, Hungary, and Poland. He walked over much of the Near East as well, marching far into the Sahara, tramping round the ruins of Troy and across Lebanon and Palestine to Jerusalem. Lugdus Will bandaged his wounds and kept walking until tortures in a Spanish Inquisition dungeon permanently crippled him and he was obliged to come home. But why he kept on walking, he never explained. The story, 
fills out in imagination this intriguing skeleton account of Lugless Will's wanderings. It's set in a part of northern Poland, which in geographical terms is reminiscent of the English Fens, and begins in a place that is now called Adamowa. But in the story, that place bears the name it had in the 17th century, Elowout, an outlying settlement in the district of what is now Elblanc, an area that had been drained in the 15th century. It was inhabited by Mennonites who had been expelled from Elblanc and from other parts of Prussia. The story's setting then implies a geographical and historical ferment of languages and cultures. And it is into this community that a figure enters who seems to embody that confusion. A figure described by Hannah Meisner, who is evidently some kind of leader of the community, as follows in the passage quoted on the handout. Perhaps he wasn't in full possession of his wits, for his words were oddly muddled, as though he spoke all tongues at the same time. In the stranger's speech, Hanna recognized bits of German and Polish, as well as a deal of Flemish. In truth, a walking Tower of Babel, a great confounding of speech, but, and this was very strange, in a way one could understand him. Strange, for the words were of all kinds, some a little familiar, some outlandish in the extreme, yet so tangled up together that in the end, like a knot, they had some kind of graspable meaning, so that you knew what he was saying, even though the individual words were obscure, outlandish, unknown. I'd just like now to refer to uh, a book which Mark very kindly uh, showed me yesterday. Uh, I had seen the uh, introduction to this book before, but I hadn't seen it in published form. It's the Paraclete Poetry Anthology, Selected and New Poems, 2005 to 2016. Uh, it's a collection of very lovely anthology uh, of poems, which also contains at least three translated poets, some of them translated by Mark here. Um, in, and Mark has written the introduction to this anthology. And in this an introduction, he suggests that poetry, in general, educates the soul, meaning the inner core of the self, by calling us to attune our minds through the practice of attention. In a world in which, as he says, speed has come to measure the outward shape of our lives, poems belong to an inner dimension which cannot be harried or hurried where instead we must, as he says, attend to the surfaces of things, finding there traces of a larger and deeper excess. David Jones seems to suggest something similar when he attempts to explain the significance of the title of his first work of literary art, in parenthesis. I have written it in a kind of space between. I don't know between quite what, but as you turn aside to do something, the motif of turning aside, of taking time to pay attention, which occurs so frequently also in the poetry of R.S. Thomas, takes us back to the story of the burning bush. Moses resolved to turn aside in order to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And it was only when God saw that he turned aside to see that he spoke to him. If Moses had passed by without paying attention, there would have been no revelation. From this, in the poem The Bright Field, Thomas, with one of his heart-stopping enjambments across a standard break, draws the following conclusion. Life is not hurrying on to a receding future, nor hankering after an imagined past. It is the turning aside, like Moses, to the miracle of the lit bush, to a brightness that seemed as transitory as your youth once, but is the eternity that awaits you. Thomas's poem confirms the intuition implied in Mark Marlborough's introduction that turning aside, taking time to pay attention, looking and listening, not hurrying, is more than a prerequisite of writing or reading poetry. It is a way of living, a way of educating the soul. Given all that I've said so far, it shouldn't surprise anyone that I claim it to be fundamental also to the translator's art. In jo Jones's preface to his later work, The Anathemata, he emphasizes that each word is meant to do its own work 
but each word cannot do its work unless it is given due attention. Translating, especially but not exclusively poetry, requires that the translator first give this due attention. Thus, even if the translator is not always or has not always been required to submit to near anonymity, there is nevertheless also another kind of humility that the activity of translating calls for, a humility of concentrated, attentive, unhurried listening. To recall the word used by Knox in the passage on the handout uh, we looked at at the beginning, translation makes us meditate on, visit and revisit the original and the translation as it progresses. When we translate, just as when we try to teach something, we find out whether we really understand it. At least this has often been my experience. We also come face to face with ourselves, our assumptions and experience in ways which can lead to greater self-knowledge and knowledge of our own culture. Seamus Heaney speaks of something like this when he describes in an essay entitled The Impact of Translation, the experience of hearing an English translation by the author and Robert Pinsky of a poem by Treswold Miwash read aloud probably sometime in the 70s of the last century. The poem is called Incantation, and Heaney says, it did things forbidden within the code of poetry with which he was familiar. It was full of unabashed abstract nouns and conceptually aerated adjectives. It was unembarrassed in its didacticism. It aspired to deliver what we had once long ago been assured it was not any poem's business to deliver. A message. <laughs> Part of the poem's impact then was to lay bare the assumptions that Heaney understood to govern approved ways of writing poetry in English. Another aspect of its impact was to reveal liberatingly that there could be other ways of writing and experiencing poetry. And yet another was to compel the listener to the poem to consider what it was that made such a different kind of poetry as Miwash's tenable. The expression of intense loss painfully stamped by the poet's own experience. The knowledge that the words of poetry could do no more than testify to what ought to be. This is a quotation from the poem in its English translation. Human reason guides our hand, so we write truth and justice with capital letters, lie and oppression with small. Human reason guides our hand, so we write truth and justice with capital letters, lie and oppression with small. The irony that human reason is not, as declared in the opening line, beautiful and invincible. That truth and justice do not automatically in life prevail over lies and oppression, as the capital letters make them do in the poem, is clear to the reader when referred to the Polish background of the poem. But is it not also revealed as characteristic of what Edwards, following Pascal, calls the misere of human experience in general? It is matters of this kind that Heaney seems to have in mind when in this essay on the imp impact of translation, he writes, I am reminded of Stephen Dedalus's enigmatic declaration that the shortest way to Tara was via Holyhead implying that departure from Ireland and inspection of the country from the outside was the surest way of getting to the core of Irish experience. The process of translation, and sometimes, as in this case, the reading of a translation, can be a way of temporarily leaving behind one's own experience and worldview, a way of exploring which could not only open the imagination to other ways of seeing and reveal how much of ourselves we may find in them, but then also allow us to return to what we are and where we, where we stand with deepened understanding and fellow feeling. In Eliot's words, with which I'd like to conclude, translating and translation can help us in our exploring and bring us, bring us back to what we thought we knew, but learning to know the place for the first time. Even if, while we live, our exploration will always only be, as Ronald Knox put it, thus far. Thank you very much.